praise the Lord. We thank God for that um, deliverance. Amen. Okay, if you can turn with me to Ephesians 6, verses 11 to 12. We've been reading this um, scripture again and again because this is our month of warfare. 2008, uh, sorry, 2017 was declared a year of supernatural help. Amen. And this is our month of warfare. Put on the whole armor. Put on God's whole armor. I'm reading the Amplified. I'm sorry, I should have said. I'm not sure if you have it. The armor of a heavy armed soldier, which God supplies, that you may be able successfully to stand up against all the strategies and deceits of the devil. For we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical op opponents, but against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly realm, supernatural sphere. Now, because there are specific scripture that speak about warfare and getting ready for warfare, there will be some overlap. So if you were here on Friday, I spoke to Deacon Allison at the end, I said, thanks, you preached my message already. <laughs> you know, if you're here on Friday, there will be some overlap, but most of you weren't here. So, congratulations. The title of my message is Victory in the Valley of Elah. Victory. Who knows what happened in the Valley of Elah? Ooh. The Valley of Elah. Now, if the children were here, they would know. That's a clue. The Valley of Elah. Hmm. Thank you. We have a Bible student. David and Goliath. That's where they fought their battle. That's where it happened. The Valley of Elah. Victory in the Valley of Elah. That's the um, title of my message. We will be referring back to the armor later. But that's the scripture that goes with it. Now, one of the greatest battles fought in the Bible was this battle between David and Goliath. And uh, this is a story that we all know, and we should know it takes place in the Valley of Elah. If you didn't, well, now you do. <laughs> but to, um, before we examine the story of what happened between the two of them, we're going to look at what the Israelites were up to before David's time, because it gives us a little bit of context. So what happened was the Israelites, they looked around like we do, you know, this is Bible truths and relevance to the game. We look around. They saw other nations. They were in a state of fear. Because at that point, they weren't really in what we call the right place. Not physical location. Spiritually, they weren't in the right place. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. I do mostly King James. So that's what you'll be hearing mostly today, King James. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together in Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. Now, we all know that the Philistines are always the you know, enemies of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Now, this is a nation that had been delivered from the Egyptians. Why would they be afraid of the Philistines? The God that did something for them before, will he not do it again? Well, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, prophet, said to rule over them, cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. They weren't really in the right place. So they go to Samuel, keep on praying. Don't stop. We need deliverance. Okay? And then they put away their strange gods. Told you they weren't in the right place. Strange gods. Now, don't start judging now, because many of us have strange gods in our homes. You know? All sorts of gods. Some of them start with I, and the next word starts with G. Some starts with F. The next one starts with B. Some starts with A. The next one starts... You picked it up. Now, the next one starts with A. A W starts, finishes off with A. All sorts of strange gods. 
all sorts. TV, all sorts of strange gods. So let's not judge. <laughs> let's not judge. Okay? So they put away their strange gods and they started to pray. The Philistines gather and they start to worship. Samuel, in verse 8, um, let, sorry, let's take it over again. They were, Samuel starts to offer up a burnt offering. So the worship starts. They start, one of the key things I'll be talking about today is how we need worship when we're in battle. How we need worship when we're in battle. So they start to worship, and Samuel offers up the um, burnt offering. And the Philistines, these enemies, they get nearer to battle. But because they had righted themselves with the prayer and the sacrifice, the Lord thundered, I'm now in verse 10, thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. That was the end of it. They were gone. Now, but I want us to now look at ourselves. How does this relate to us? You know, the way they approached Samuel and they said, don't cease praying for us. That's us. Going to pastor, going to the brothers in the house. The sisters, please keep on praying for me on this issue. There's nothing wrong in, in asking for prayer. But where do you stand? Are you in the right place? Where do you stand and how do you stand? Do you stand strong or do you stand with your knees trembling where there's no faith? You're asking for prayer, but you don't believe. Pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. In fact, the reason why you keep on going and asking for prayer is because you don't believe. Sometimes you, can't, you don't believe your own prayer can reach the Lord God Almighty. Or because you are fully aware that you're not where you're supposed to be, that's why you're asking for prayer. There are all sorts of different reasons. So I'm not saying don't ask for prayer, but we need to check ourselves. Where do we stand? How do we stand? Are we like the Israelites who were standing with their knees trembling in fear when they saw the Philistines camp against them? Okay? Anyway, let's just keep that in mind. This was their experience. This is their testimony. The Lord had fought for them time and time again. I would expect them to look back, look at history, their history, and say, we don't need to fear. The Philistines, they could be wiped out in the blink of an eye. Why are they so scared? You know, the enemies, the Egyptians were just wiped out in the Red Sea. Why are they so scared? But that's the way we are. We forget. We have short memories. We just forget. We start to behave as some, like someone who's never had a testimony before. As if the Lord had never, ever done anything for us before. As if we've got no benchmarks for us to, you know, put our belief in. Anyway, life goes on. Things happen in chapter 8. Samuel grows old. His sons rule as judges. They're not in the right place after either. They walk not in his ways. And, you know, they get into all sorts of trouble. Anyway, the Israel, Israelites, they decide to reject Samuel's um, headship. And they ask for a king. Now, one of the reasons why they ask for a king is that they look around. They looked around at other nations who were ruled by kings. And they preferred that because they were not like the others. How many times do you and I look around at the Joneses? How many times? So they reject theocracy, which is the headship and the kingship of God over them. They completely reject it. We want a king, we want a king. Something less. God is the one directing you, and you now want man? Why would you make that kind of choice? But this is what the nation wanted. They wanted a man. They wanted a king, like everybody else has. Okay. Chapter 8, verses 11, and 11 to 17. Let's have a quick read of that. Samuel warned them. He said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons. He will appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. Some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint them captains over thousands and captains over fifties. He will set them to 
ear his ground to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of chariots. He will make your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. He will, make, he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. You know how kings do. That's mine, that's mine, that's mine, and I'll have that girl too. Well, he's the, they're the king. The king can do anything. Samuel warned them, but they still insisted, we want a king. He will take the tenth of your sheep, that's the tithe, he sh and you will be his servants. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye, have cho which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day because it was your choice. You asked for it. Okay, but nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, nay, but we will have a king over us. Okay. So theocracy is rejected in favor of something less, and they get their king. So who do you know to be their king? Saul comes on the scene. Just because they want to be like the Joneses, Saul comes on the scene. Let's look at verse 20. Um, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So God has been fighting your battles. Now you want a man to fight. Why would you have a man fight your battle after God has been, I mean, the last one that we read of, he just thundered. The one before, you know, the other main one in my mind is the Red Sea. He just split a sea and he had them flooded. And your enemies were wiped out. Now you say you want a man. Okay, we want a man to, a man to fight our battles. Many a time, you and I, we look to men to fight our battles. Because that's what we see everybody else do. And we think that that is the way to go and the thing to do. We look to man to fight our battles. Okay, anyway, they made a choice. What is it that God directs us to do that we don't do because we want to be like the Joneses. Let's think about that as well. What is it that God is asking us to do in a battle? But just because everybody else around us doesn't fight it that way or sort it that way, we don't do it. How many times have you and I rejected theocracy because we want to be like the Joneses? All right, chapter 9, Saul turns up. Now, we know the story of he lost, his father lost his asses, he went looking, came across Samuel, and so on and so forth, and he was anointed. God is merciful and so kind. He gives them a king that is even better looking than the Joneses king. <laughs> because if you look in chapter 9, verse 2, um, his father had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man, and... A goodly, that means he was very good to look at. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. He was extremely handsome. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. Where's Isaac? Come out here a minute. <laughs> Isaac, where is he? Can you get him for me? I need him. <laughs> From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. Come up front. Okay, all right. Uh, who are we gonna call? Dick and Tony. Uh, now we're doing that. <laughs> all right, Roberta. I crave your indulgence. Thank you. I face the uh, congregation. I just want you to understand ahead. <laughs> Roberta's not even tall enough, actually, because <laughs> she's not even up to his shoulder. But, you know, a whole head above everybody else in the kingdom. Everybody else in the kingdom. I had taller. Okay, thank you. You can sit down. Um, Isaac, don't go too far. Sit on past the seat there. Okay. Ahead, ahead, but very tall. So he commanded a presence when he walked into a room. He looked like a king. Appearances. He looked like a king. You know, when people came his way, they'll go, oh, yeah, that's the king of Israel. Oh, yeah, wow. You know, everybody was impressed. He's good looking too. Wow, so God gave them, you know, the king that they needed, that they wanted, not needed, that they wanted. All right, so he's anointed king in chapter 10, and in verse 9, 
the Lord sought him out completely. He was a goodly person, but, well, that was good looking anyway. He gave him a new heart for kingship. He equipped him for that service. Okay, he was completely transformed and regenerated for service. Let me just see where that is. That's probably 10 verse 9. 10, yes. 10, chapter 10 verse 9. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And then all those signs that uh, Samuel had prophesied came to pass. So he equipped him for that service. He was transformed, regenerated. He was reborn. Reborn to be king over the people of God. Just like you and I, we were reborn for service. We were anointed and selected to do a work. All right. But even, check out Saul though, even after the appointment, which was sort of done in secret, you know, when he went looking for the asses, when the time came to present him to the country, what, what does he do? He hid among the stuff. Didn't know that there was stuff in the Bible, but there you go, it's there. Everything's there. He, he was hiding, he was in hiding, he, he lacked in confidence. He didn't feel that he could do that job that God had appointed um, him for. He didn't feel equipped to do it. But the Lord had equipped him with a new heart. Okay? And he was tremendously blessed. Not only was he equipped with a new heart, he was even given um, a band of men whose hearts God had touched. So God touched some hearts specifically to assist him in the work that he had him do. And they followed him from that day forward. Okay? All right. So anyway, we're looking at Saul, his lack of confidence and so on. Some of us here are hiding among the stuff. You know that, don't you? We're hiding among the stuff. Let me find that stuff scripture. Um, 22, thank you. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord further because they kept on bringing everybody out and... He wasn't there. If the man should yet come thither, and the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, it was higher than any other people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there be none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. And then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. Okay, so they've got their king. It's all working out. They got their king with a transformed heart, and he's got people to work with him. Okay, now, let's not forget the enemy. Because if you look at verse 27, the children of Bilal said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him. So even though he was chosen of God, he still had enemies. Even though the people had asked for a king and God gave them a king, there were still some that despised him. There's always an enemy within. Even the person that called for you might despise you. So we need to watch and pray and hold our peace. Look at the last, the end of that verse. But Saul, he held his peace. He was chosen. He didn't need to start fighting his own battles. He just held his peace. So let's learn from that. Okay? Don't be upset. Just hold your peace. Now, all this is a preamble about the state that Israel was in before we eventually meet Goliath. So, because later on, the human soul, that's why I call him, became a victim of his self. He became a victim of his self, and he... He does a couple of things that are wrong. One of them was that he intrudes into the priest's office and he offered a burnt offering to the Lord, which wasn't his place. And then another one was he was told to wipe out the Amalekites and he didn't. So disobedience, self-will, might be pride. He thought, I'm king now. I'm a head taller than everybody else. I'm really good looking. Everybody listens to me. Maybe he wasn't used to it. He became a victim of himself. His height couldn't help him <laughs> at that point. Because God needed a man after his own heart. Okay? Not a self-serving one. Not a self. He need, God needs a man after his own heart. And he went to find David, who was a man after his own heart. The Lord always knows our motives. He knows exactly what it is we are thinking. After all, he created us. Okay? The triune nature of man was created by, by, by God after his own image. 
spirit, soul, and body. Okay? He knows our motives. He sees the heart. Nothing can be hid from God. So from time to we have to keep on checking our motives. Why are we doing what we're doing? Are we doing it for the right reasons? Would the Lord have us do it differently? Okay? Those are things that we need to do as Christians. Just, that's just by the, by the wayside. Let's go to chapter 15 now. Okay, we want to meet David. Saul's messed up in those couple of chapters that we missed. Okay, so. Um, oh, 15, 28. I think that's another one of his blunders. 28. Oh, yes. So after his blunder, complete, incomplete obedience, Samuel said to him, The Lord had rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and I've given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. That's how he lost it. Now, just because he's on the throne didn't mean he hadn't lost it. He was on the throne, but it was gone. It was gone. It was gone. Even though he remained king, it was almost like king in name only. Everybody saw him as king, but the word had been spoken. The kingdom was no longer his. He was no longer recognized as God, as king over Israel. The Lord had chosen another, his neighbor. Somebody else had been chosen. Okay. So chapter 16, verse 7. We meet David. Um, Samuel was sent to a particular house to go and pick another king because the Lord had made up his mind that Saul's finished with. When he gets there, what does Samuel do? He thinks it's a tall one. Who can blame him? Last time the Lord chose a tall one. So the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance. Stop looking at the face. Or on the height of his stature. Because I've refused him. That's the one that um, Samuel thought it would be. For the Lord seeth not as, the man, see, as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. So in this case, things are going to be slightly different. He's not going to get a regenerated heart. He's, the Lord now is now looking for somebody with a, a man who is after him, who is after his own heart. Okay? So now what I want to just drop in there is that some people here have been selected for positions that are currently occupied, but it's yours. It's done. Catch it if it's yours. Because a changeover is coming. Verses 13 to 14, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. That's David. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. The spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. A changeover is coming. Many here are being prepared for higher positions. Now, I love God's sense of humor. He has taken the kingship away from Saul. Saul but Saul is still sitting on a throne, in quote. He then works it out so that David works for him. <laughs> You've just got to admire that. Now, I, I dwelt on this. I thought, why would the Lord do that? Take David to the king's court to work for the king, in quote, after anointing that same person for kingship. But then I thought, well, David's just a shepherd boy. He had no idea how court worked. But by working for Saul, that was his training ground. So don't worry if you're in your training ground. Because the throne is secure. It's secure. Okay, you're being prepared for that higher position. So he could begin to understand how court worked and what needed, how kings behave. He was there in training for kingship with the king. The irony of it all. By the time he sat on the throne, he was no longer, you know, not, not a stranger to palace life at all. The Lord worked it all out. So we go to chapter 17. Now the Philistines, the enemy again, gathering again, gathering. The enemy will always gather. Okay, let's just sort that now. If you are walking in your Christian life and you have no collision with the enemy, that means you're walking in the same direction. You are supposed to collide from time to time because you're walking in opposite directions. So there should be some kind of collision. So I don't know who's been telling you that everything is smooth and, you know, there are no thorns. It's not true. There are supposed to be collisions. So the Philistines gathered. 
surely shall they gather. And they gathered on Israel's territory, the cheek of it all, on Israel's territory, on their land. So verse 1, 17 verse 1. The Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Soko, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Soko and Az Azekah and Ephes Damnim, however you pronounce that. And um, Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah. Now you know. And set the battle in array against the Philistines. So they just kind of lined up, you know, with all their gear. They lined up. And they sort of waited, facing each other. One on one's, one, one on one, one's, there's the valley in between. The valley of Eli is in between them. So they're on one hillside and Philistines are on the other. Okay. They didn't run. Let's give them some credit. They faced their enemy. So let's learn from that. Don't run. Because he who is on the inside of you is greater than he that is in the world. So don't run. Who is it? What is it? What is the situation that is the problem that's causing this battle in your life? Don't run. Stand. So they stood. Verse 3. Philistines stood on the mountain on one side. Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. And there was a valley in between them. Stay on your side. Some of us have blurred the lines. You know, we sort of came off our hill. We were in the valley. Before we knew it, we were climbing up the other side. You know, think these things happen. Get back to your camp. Stay on your side. Get back to your camp and stay there. Don't cross the boundary. Okay? Don't cross the boundary. Don't join the enemy. Don't go and have a look. <laughs> Some people know what I'm talking about. Uh, don't go and have a look on the other side. Don't, you don't, just stay on your side. There needs to be a clear divide between yourself and the enemy. The valley should be in between. Clear. All right. Now, the Philistines had a champion, verse 4. Um, they had Goliath, didn't they? So there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Isaac will stand again. We'll talk about height. Six cubits, turn around, and a span is nine feet and six inches. Now, Isaac tells me he stands at six feet and five or six inches. He's not sure because he's still growing. The last time he checked... <laughs> And he hasn't checked recently because he's still growing. So he stands at six feet, five or six. Goliath stood at nine feet. <laughs> and six. Nine feet and six. Just kind of looking up there, trying to imagine putting another three feet on top of that. That's where he was. No wonder the Philistines did not need to do any other thing but present Goliath and a challenge. They didn't need to do anything else. Give us a man to fight this man. And whoever wins is the winner. Sure banker. Just give us one man. Let's fair fight. One man, give us another man. <laughs> Thank you. I think they've got, they've got the idea of <laughs> how tall he is. <laughs> you see, the enemy will always look bigger. But it's just physical. It's just physical. Okay? His size made him confident. And he began to insult God's people. Day one. Day two. Day three. D for 40 days he was presented and he would insult God's army. Give me a man. The enemy is always overconfident. Okay? Surely they will rise, but surely they shall fall. So we've already talked about having enemies. Yes, we will have enemies. We have, the, we have one enemy which is the devil, and he has his little errand boys that he sends around, or girls, or whatever they are, little spirits that he sends around to trouble you. Okay? 
But as long as we keep that battle line drawn and we don't blur it, we don't wipe it, we don't go sightseeing on the other side, we know we are winners. Can I have slide one, please? Let's look at the organizational structure of the heavenly realm. So this is from Dick and Allison. I borrowed this from Friday. So the organizational structure of the heavenly realm, we've got God Almighty, Jehovah, okay? Uh, he's the creator and commander in chief, apparently not commander in charge. On one side, we have the kingdom of God. <laughs> and then the other side, we have the kingdom of Satan. Now, first of all, let's talk about numbers. How many demons or fallen angels does Satan have? Thank you. Now, let's do the math. This is amazing. I'm doing math. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so for every one of those fallen angels, how many have we got in God's kingdom? Two. What are you worried? What are you worried about? What are you worried about? It's two to one. And that's just on the angel demon rank. It's two to one. They are, they are outnumbered. Okay? They're outnumbered. And who is more powerful in Jesus and the devil? I thought that was an answer everybody knew. <laughs> it, really? I thought maybe. <laughs> so what, what are we worried about? Why do we keep on trembling at the knees? What should our response be when we collide in battle? What should the response be? It should be confidence. First of all, you know what side you're on and you know who you've got backing you. And you also know prophetically that the battle is already won. So what is the problem? The battle is won already. Amen. We are winners. Amen. We just need to work it out. It's already happened. Okay. Don't be moved by what you see. They are outnumbered. Okay. So you need to just remember appearances and reality. The appearance was a nine foot six giant who was supposed to win the battle for the Philistines. That was the appearance. But the reality was something else, as we all know. Okay? The reality that we have is that we serve a very big God. In fact, big doesn't really describe the size of God. Big is a small word compared to how, who our God is. Okay? And he is right here as we sang that song. He is right here with you. Always. Always. Goliath wears a physical protection. Verses 5 to 7. He had a helmet of brass upon his head, armed with a coat of mail. Weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, brass. He had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his soldiers. His shoulders, not just his sides, but all these things he's wearing as well were intimidating. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Yeah. But the mistake he made was, this was a spiritual war. Even though they stood with the valley of Elah between them, this was a spiritual war. He made it a spiritual war when he said... Let me find what he said. He said, I defy, verse 10, the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. He defied the armies of God, the armies of Israel. Israel, God's chosen one? Mistake. But we know that, well, we, we don't live in that time. But we do have battles, and we do conquer, and we will continue to conquer. The weapons that we use are not carnal, like what he has here. It's not going to do anything. It's not going to get you anywhere. 
okay? So let's take our eyes off those things that the Joneses are using to fight the battles because it's not going to work for you and I because we are a royal priesthood. We are a chosen generation. We are different. We are different. Okay. If any come against me, they come against God, my defender. I do not defend myself. Why should I? Many a time I see Christians trying to defend themselves. What for? Save your energy for prayer. Why would you want to defend yourself? I always like to let God fight the battles. After all, he's already won it. And that's the instruction anyway. Hold your peace. Let the Lord fight the battle for you. You just need to stand and watch the outcome manifest itself in the physical. And then you are in awe at how the Lord worked it out. Like, wow. Sometimes I see some naughty situations and I think, I wonder how the Lord is going to work this out. Anyway, what's my business? I just need to stand and watch. And then I just watch. Be patient. Just watch. You don't need to defend yourself. Just watch. And the Lord will work it out in your favor. He will work it out in your favor. And you will stand in amazement. You don't even know how. Or sometimes he just makes some moves, some strategic moves, and everything just falls into place. And you are victorious. Wow. Anyway, so back to um, Goliath. Insulting the army of Israel for 40 days. If you insult me and I'm standing on the right side of God, you insult my God. Today I choose God. Don't touch me. The Bible says, touch not my anointed. Don't touch me because I'm standing on the right side of God. That's why you must make sure you don't go sightseeing on the other side or make any lines blurry. Stand on the right side. Then you're really covered. Okay? When the enemy chooses to speak against you, have you given him any rights? If the enemy brings something up against you, have you given him some, cut him some slack or given him some rope to give him some rights? So when you look at Job, for instance, for him, his case is slightly different. If you look at Job chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, because the Lord was actually showing Job off to the enemy and saying, oh, have you seen my servant Job? The Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? He hates evil. And that's why God allowed him, because the, the devil then said, um, it's only because you make a hedge about him and about his house and all that he had on every side. So this is the result of being upright in heart, fearing God. But because, which is, you know, which is the truth. That's the truth by the devil. You didn't let anybody touch him. But if you let me touch him, I'm sure he will curse, he will curse you and die. God says, no, he won't. I know his heart. All right, let me touch him. Yes, but spare his life. He will not curse me. Spare his life. So he did. The devil did move in against him. And when we look at what happened when adversity came to Job. Look at um, verse 20 and 21. Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head fell down upon the ground and worshipped. He worshipped. He said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's after all his children have been wiped out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He did In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He worshipped. Okay. Now, can I, if you were a victim of Grenfell Tower, we all know about Grenfell Tower, right? How would you respond? Or if you knew a Christian who lived in Grenfell Tower and lost their life, 
or they lost their family, how would you respond? Slide two, please. How would you respond to that? When this happened, we used to talk about it every day in my office, every day. And eventually, when I went to London, I went to have a look. I went to Grenfell Tower myself to have a look. Those are not my pictures, but I do have pictures on my phone. And the pictures cannot really explain or express the devastation and the loss that you see when you're there. Because when you're at Grenfell Tower, there are posters everywhere. Latimer Road Station. You turn to the left, posters of missing because the government will not declare that these people are dead. Yet, they are missing. If the body has not been recovered, they are missing. They are not dead yet. There are posters everywhere. And some people have more than one poster. Well, most people have more, but there are just some posters that stand out. You look this way, you see this poster of this 12-year-old girl. You look that way, she's over there again, big color. Another one over there, same poster, big color, same girl, same girl, same girl. Same couple, same couple, same couple. An Italian couple. Their poster's black and white. And your heart is just heavy because you know what happened, that it was something that could be avoided. Spiritual wickedness in high places. It could have been avoided. These people have been crying out from 2010 about the inability of fire engines to be able to reach them in the event of a fire, about the lack of various things in their block that should be there, but the law covers. So if you were a victim, you lost a family member, like Job did, how would you respond? I mean, I hear responses like this. We query God. Why? She was a Christian. Or we judge. Maybe he was a sinner. Or maybe he lost everything because he didn't tithe. We like to judge. Or we just cry. Well, well. Well, why God? Why, why, why? Job did the opposite. He just worshipped. He just worshipped. Okay, back to um, 1 Samuel 17, verse 18. Verse 8, sorry. So he stands and he cries to the armies of Israel. Verse 8. Why you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not, am not I a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. He used to cry this, make a lot of noise. There will be a lot of noise in battle. When you're in battle, there's a lot of noise, a lot of distraction. To make you lose your focus. To, to make you confused. You won't be able to think straight because the noise. You can imagine Goliath just shouting constantly. You can't think straight. The taunt, the taunts will fill your head. Even when he's not shouting, you will remember them. They will fill your head because the enemy always seems to be bigger, louder, better than you. They have an appearance of better equipment, but all they're trying to do is create fear. They work with fear. But you and I should know the Lord God of hosts whom we serve and not be moved because God has not given us a spirit of fear. <laughs> but of power, love, and a sound mind. We should not allow our heads to be filled with that noise. We should not lose focus because of the noise, because of the distractions, because it's just appearances. Appearances. It's just appearances. We know our reality. So we believe and we worship. We worship. You see that song that I asked to be sang, the Gashin and Gamunan? That's a worship song. Guess what it's in response to? It's in response to the battle 
that Christians in the just area of Nigeria are going through. Can I have slide three, please? Look at the headlines. Slide three. Oh, can you see that clearly? More than 70 Christians killed in Plato State. Dozens of Christians killed in Plato State. These are various headlines. Nigeria, Nigeria's violence, um, ra violent, violent raids on Christian villages near Jos. Nigeria, religious violence in Jos. Nigeria, packed church saved from bomb attack in Jos. That song came from the Jos area. The guy who's, who wrote it, Kingsley Innocent something. He comes from there. That song is a response to the attack on Christians that you and I have no idea. You think you're under attack? It's a response to that. That worship song is a response to that adversity. Pause and think about that. Let's look at the words again, slide four. It's a warrior song. What is it saying? Where two or three are gathered, Lord, you said you'd be there. So, Lord, we're here. Automatically, we honor your presence. He is here. Here he is. Here we are. The king of heaven, he is here. Declared. Two or three gathered. You said you'd be there. So we welcome you, Lord. You're here. We believe it. We don't doubt it. The song declares the presence of God in battle. The presence of God is more than enough. So if you're on the right side, you don't really need to do much. The presence of God is more than enough. We see the walls of Jericho fall in Joshua 6 verse 20. Because they praised. Because they worshipped. They walked around a wall. It fell. So how do you and I respond to battles when they come? We need to correct it. What do we do? Have, first of all, have you, do you even know the enemy? Have you identified the enemy yet? Have you identified the manifestation of the enemy in your life? Okay, because it's not like you get home and you see some guy sitting on your settee with a pitchfork. You know, with a long tail, with a red head, pointed ears. You don't see anything like that when you get home, do you? So have you identified the manifestation of the enemy in your life? What is, how, how is the enemy manifesting? Some of us need to, we just need to soul search. We need to pray. We need to find out where the battle is taking place. Because some of us, we're in a battle and we're not even aware that we're in a battle. Okay? <laughs> the angels are working overtime on our behalf. The, the battle is on our doorstep. It's in our homes. It's in our lives, in our families, in our hearts. And we haven't even identified the battle. We're just going around smiling, feeling good, having dinner, going to work, coming back. And battles, the battle is there. But we're not doing what we need to do. Now, for Saul and the Israelites, their response to the battleground was fear and confusion. And many of us, when we're aware that we're in a battle, we do respond like that. Fear and confusion. I mean, this month, our month of warfare, you want the list? One of my loved ones had had a mastectomy last week. My nephew had an eye operation Friday. My daughter, well, not this month. That, I think that was last month she had an operation. Uh, my mother is due to have an operation on her right. It's just, the list just goes on. I can't, I've, I'm, I've lost count. One thing after the other. It's one thing after the other. How am I, how am I getting through it? Praise. Worship. Am I afraid? No, not really. Because God is. He is. And I know whose side I stand on. He is. I shall not be moved. What's your response? Are you aware of the battle that you're supposedly supposed to be fighting? Okay. So the fear and confusion. First Samuel 17 verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were Philistine. 
They were dismayed and greatly afraid. You know, when the um, Bible puts an adverb in front of a, you know, that they because they want to say something, they were distraught, greatly afraid. How are we ever going to get somebody to fight that? We have lost this. And day after day, he ridiculed them. Dismayed, confused, greatly af afraid. Now, David then turns up on the scene. I need to speed this up now. Um, he overheard this ridicule as he went to see his brothers. And he, his immediate response was verse 26. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and take, taketh away the reproach from Israel? As if to say, how dare he say that? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? That was his response. Who? What? Where? Who? Is this what's been going on? Is this the battle? They present this guy and he insults us. And you're all shaking. 39. They try and give him physical things to fight when he volunteers. I'll do it. He says, no, that won't work. He rejects the physical armor, but Goliath is in physical armor. But he rejects it. So verses um, no, five and seven. Why did I write five and seven? Oh, like the, the one Goliath wears in, five, in verses five and seven. He knows it can't save him. Don't depend on the arm of the flesh. It won't save you. Can I have sl um, slide five? He kept his equipment simple. Staff, sling, five stones from a brook. Simple. And then he adds on to that the power which is required, which is the name of the Lord of hosts. Verse 45 to 47. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with the sword and with the spear and with the shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and I will take thine head. I want you to imagine the size. He was probably somewhere down there, and Goliath was up there. He was a young lad. He wasn't fully grown. Okay? This day... I will take thine head from thee. I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day to the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. And all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. I don't come to you by myself. I've got back in. He spoke so confidently. He was assured of the victory and he began to describe to Goliath what he was going to do with his head and body. He was assured of the victory before he received the physical manifestation of that victory. He knew it was going to happen because he knew and understood the God that he served. The bit I love the best is after he knocks him out with a tiny stone in his forehead, he then takes his tool, the enemy's tool is loose to cut his head off. Because when he was stunned, he wasn't dead. He was just knocked out. But verse 51, David ran stood upon the Philistine and took his sword, drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. There shall be a reversal. That trap that was set to destroy you shall destroy your enemies instead. Verse 52. There was victory in the valley of Elah. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou cometh to the valley unto the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Sharem, even to Gath, unto Ekron. There was victory. Then we see the physical manifestation of the victory. But it was always in hand. You see, the victory is always in hand. We just need to work it out. The victory is always in hand. We are not losers, we are winners. It's time to face our giants. Can we have slide six? If we are facing our gi giants, we need to identify our giants. Where are they? What are they? 
Okay? Think about what those giants are that need to be destroyed. Slide seven and eight. Uh, slide seven. Eight. Well, we're going to run through the slides really quickly. What do you need? You need to get quitted with the right, right equipment. Ephesians 6, verses 11 to 13. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For do we, we do not wrestle or fight against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly realm. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Next one. And these are the weapons. That we may be able to withstand the evil day. Stand therefore, gird with your waist with truth. Put on the best place, breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers, supplication, thanksgiving, all kinds of prayers. Let's run through quickly. The belt is true. Oh, sorry. Um, you have your defensive weapons and the offensive weapons. So the offensive weapons, your sword, which is the word of God, which we need to, the more we read, the more we retain it on the inside of us. It, it deposits itself inside our spirit. And when you need it, it will come forth. Out of your belly shall flow rivers. Um, um, sorry. River, yeah, rivers of living water. That's it. Rivers of living water. When you read the word of God, it does stick. Prayer. And then your defensive weapons are your belt. Let's go to the next slide, which is the truth. Go to the next one, please. The truth is Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The next one, the breastplate of righteousness, which protects the heart. We need to guard our heart with all our strength for the things there, there, are, in life, there are in life come out of it. So guard our heart, protect it. Next one, please. Boots of peace. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. As believers, we need sound understanding of the Bible and we need readiness to act as well. Let's share the gospel with people around us. Next one, please. Shield of faith. Covers all the parts, especially the heart as we hold it in front. For every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith. We need to believe. Stop shaking. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the son of God. Well, you need to be redeemed. So we put our faith before us and it protects us. Next one, please. We have the helmet of salvation. As a helmet of hope and salvation. Okay, do you believe that the Lord is your God? Is he your savior? which links back to the faith. Next one, please, which is the sword of the spirit, the word of God, which is the, one of the main weapons of attack. So the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, we need to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers. We read that before. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and marrows, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Amen. The Lord knows our heart. Next one. Okay, we're rounding it up. The truth about warfare. The battle or fight is in the spiritual realm. We've identified that. The enemy forces are beings without bodies, but sometimes they inhabit. And so it looks like you're seeing them physically because they're in a person. The victory is already won by Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. When he rose from the dead, the victory was sorted. Our duty then, when we hold on to this knowledge, is that we walk in that victory and we enforce God's kingdom on earth because we have victory in the valley of Elah. And we have victory in the valley of Elah because he is there, right there with us. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll be right there in their midst. He is with us. We do not need to fear because Jesus, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them, okay? In Joshua, verse, uh, chapter one, verse three, the word says, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, 
that have I given unto you. And this is my favorite one. This is the one I always hold on to. Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14. The battle is the Lord's. Moses told the people, fear not. Stand still. Be firm, be confident, be undismayed. And see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians you have seen today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace and remain at rest. There will always be victory in the valley of Elah. Habakkuk 3.19, to round up. Habakkuk 3.19. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hind's feet. You know, like the feet of a goat. Hind's feet. He will make me to walk upon mine high places. Anybody been to Wales before? Seen those little mountain goats? Standing like the, <laughs> I don't even know how to explain it. You know, the mountain is like this, and they're standing on the side, and they're, and they're not falling off the side of the mountain. I watch them in awe. It's because their feet are created to stay somehow, stay, st stay firm, and they don't fall, even though they're sideways on the mountain. So the Lord will make your feet like hind's feet. He will make you to walk upon your high places. Amen. High places are places of trouble, by the way. Just to let you know that. Because I used to think I used to think that high places were like, oh, the Lord is lifting me up, and that's why it was my favorite verse. But then I found out it was places of trouble. I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay, before we um, bring Deacon Austin up to to pray, so that you don't think that I've left Pastor. <laughs> I won't be around for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Pastor will be back this week, um, but I will be leaving this week as well. Um, I'll be traveling around a couple of countries. Um, my prayer is that I'll be able to touch lives as I go and make a difference for Christ. That will make it all worthwhile. Okay, so I'll be away for a while. I'll be back for the anniversary. Yeah, I'm away for a while. I'll be back for the anniversary. <laughs> I'll be back for the um, anniversary. So, um, it is well. Amen. Amen. It is well. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Choir, yeah. can you come back, please? I'd like to go out on a Gashinan because I really like that song. A simple declaration. Can we stand? A simple declaration of the presence of God brings victory in battle. A simple declaration of the presence of God brings victory in battle. So. Believe your victory. 